Brittany Rizzo, and welcome to My Only Friends. Today's episode is a roller coaster ride with Stan Zimmerman. Stan is a television producer, director, and screenwriter. I am a fan of literally all of his work, from Golden Girls, Gilmore Girls, and a very Brady sequel. Just knowing Stan is responsible for Logan Huntsberger makes me a Stan fan for life. He is funny, smart, and his heart shines through in all of his art. This episode reminds me of the Friends episode, the one with the ultimate fighting champion. In this episode, we are introduced to Bonnie, played by Christine Taylor. Christine also played Marsha in the Brady Bunch movies, which Stan wrote. I think Stan and I could have spent the entire hour quoting her iconic lines. I do want to say before listening to this episode, we do talk about suicide and serious mental health issues. I encourage you to listen, but if this is a subject that triggers you, please use your discretion. If you love all things Gilmore Girls, Brady Bunch movies, and Golden Girls, you will love this episode. Please enjoy my conversation with Stan Zimmerman. I've got my short jam mug. Oh my gosh. Okay. Can I just tell you, my really close friend, Jake and I, we are obsessed with the Brady Bunch movies. <laughs> like truly, there were nights where we would just be like, cause we used to live together and we would just be like, can we watch the Brady Bunch movie tonight? You know, I mean, that's a whole other discussion about, I mean, how twisted those were and that they let us go out there. They literally, and I don't know if you want this to be in the show, but- Betty, Yes, absolutely. Betty Thomas said, should I save it for the show? We're recording. Oh, we're recording now. Okay. Yeah. Um, Betty Thomas, the director, when we got the job. So there had been three or four other writers before us. And then we came on uh, right before they started casting. And it was just supposed to be a two-week polish. And then we just fell in love with Betty Thomas. And we just made her laugh. And she they kept hiring us on next two weeks, next two weeks, all during filming. And um, But she said, think of it as three-pronged. Write it for kids that have never seen the show. Write it for everyone that had grew up with it. Mm-hmm. And then write it for stoners. We're like, we're in. <laughs> <laughs> and we might have leaned into the stoner part a little bit more. Oh, and for sure. We just went way out. And just and she kept saying, oh, keep going. So because it was, we came into it so late into the movie on, on the first one, we couldn't change any of the set. So mm. everything was already planned out. Like we knew what days we were going to film at the school and what days we had the house and all that was set. But Betty said, whatever you want to change within that, that set you can do. So we just went to town and like little things like when you watch uh, Carol Brady in the coffee mug and she's pouring the sugar, just pouring sugar. Pouring, <laughs> Cause she was so sweet. I said, what if she's just pouring it through the whole scene? And like so many people, it will go over their head. Yeah. People like you will be like, what the hell is she doing? Yeah. And she's like, it's like everybody's like cutting back and being healthy. And she's like buying slabs of meat and pouring sugar in her coffee. It is so good. And one of the parts that we laugh so hard about is when um, Alice just walks into, she's like, good night, everybody. And walks into the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, what is wrong with those people? Well, what's wrong with me and Jim? Yeah. So, no, yeah. it is so good. And like George Glass, like there's so many things things like that we reference or we'll start talking like and like cut my hair thousand dollars yeah. <laughs> cut my hair <laughs> <laughs> and she's like oshkosh bagosh like it's so good yes. there's just so many amazing references and it's the perfect parody movie like it is so good and i love shelly long so much what was it like working with her yeah that she did that you know mm-hmm. and um Gary Cole, nobody expected him. Mm-hmm. I remember Betty coming running into the, they stuck us literally, and I think like it used to be a closet, uh, but it was an office they made for us. So they just said, just put them in there and k- keep throwing scenes at them and let them do their thing. And she, Betty ran and she goes, All right, just listen to this. She had filmed him, videotaped him. She goes, But I'm not, don't look at who it is. Tell me if you can guess. And it was Robert Reed, but sounded uh-huh. like him, but it was Gary Cole. And he was not known for comedy. And we're like, you have to cast them. I mean, he just got it down to a T and totally understood, as did Shelley and especially Christine Taylor and Jennifer Lee Cox. Oh my gosh, when, so good. When we started seeing the dailies with those two, we were just like, we got to write more for them. I mean, they were the stars. And we've been trying to sell with the two of them and Olivia Hack a series called The Brady Ladies. 
Oh my and we God. wanted to set it in the time when the, we made the movie. So the mid 80s. Yeah. They are still stuck in the mid 80s, but it's present day. <laughs> and they all moved to West Hollywood as, as an apartment, as a, a divorcee, a widow. And of course, Jan has never been married because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> West Hollywood with RuPaul as their uh, landlord. How funny would that be? That would be so. I, I that would know. be incredible. Well, talk to Paramount Plus because they passed on the project. Oh my god! Yeah. Another reason to be mad at the studios right now. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna strike just because of that. <laughs> Literally. Oh my gosh, that would be so amazing. I mean, I love RuPaul so much, and even in that movie, like just so good. There's so many gems, and that would be incredible to see them living in West Hollywood in present day. So you have to remember, back then, nobody knew who RuPaul was. Mm-hmm. People were reading actresses like Jennifer Lewis and Charlie Ralph and people like that. And we wanted it to be Black uh, Miss Cummings. And then I was out in West Hollywood um, at the Revolver Bar drinking a martini and up came this new music video. And it was, uh, you know, RuPaul's first song. Wow. And I was like, wait a minute. Hmm, is this vodka talking or is this a great idea? And I went to work the next day and I said, all right, guys, you got to track down this, this new drag singer. Yeah. RuPaul. And called him in and he was great and he got his first job and that a major studio hired a drag queen mm-hmm. to do the thing. it was just in the movie mm-hmm. i remember i didn't we, we were busy writing on a tv show then and i didn't we didn't have time because those are long hours and i said no rupaul's i'm going to the set and i was on set and i i whispered to betty all right it's not in the script but when jan goes to leave and just tell him to say and jan you better work yes it's like why would we do that? I go, trust me, just have it in the can, you know, just in case. Not knowing that that song and that phrase would turn into, you know, literally. Brilliant. Uh, yeah. And so she put it in and then she ended up getting the music, which underscores it from this song. That is amazing. I did not know that. <laughs> that is so cool. That was just being on on set. You know, that's why it's so great. Unfortunately, you know, uh, you can't go to set now. Mm-hmm. Jim and I actually... Uh, finished a Lifetime Christmas movie oh. right as the strike ended. I mean, May 1st, we were like at 9 o'clock doing a rewrite. And yeah. And down, done. And then two weeks later, it got greenlit, and they filmed it before the actors' strike. And I would love to tell you who's in it, but I can't. But I will soon. <laughs> um, it's an all-star cast. of uh, Again, it's us writing five great women roles. Oh, I love that. Older women roles, but it'll be out at Christmas time. Um, But we couldn't go to set because we were on strike. Yeah, I was just going to ask, like, how are you feeling? Like, do you feel like there's a light at the end of the tunnel? Or are you like, is it does it comes in waves, I would imagine? Um, I am a glass, uh, a George Glass half full. I'm a George Glass half full. (laughs) Glass. Um, in my school. Um, oh my uh, God. I'm going to be the prettiest the girl in school. That school was just like, nobody told her to say that. She just, she invented that. And then we just went to town. With it. Amazing. Um, you know, they're, the other side is not even coming to the table. I mm-hmm. wish someone like Gavin Newsom or somebody would just say, everyone, you're going to eventually figure it out. Sit down now. Right. Save jobs and lives and just food for Put on the table i mean i'm i'm very busy uh in theater now so mm-hmm. my time is taking up so much doing that so it's uh it's not like it was years ago and i've done so many strikes and i've picketed so many times but that was when my livelihood was all just television and film right so because i've kind of refocused on teaching but also directing and writing and producing theater uh my days are so filled i'm uh doing some recasting. I've been doing this Latinx Diary of Anne Frank, which is coming back in September for four school shows. Uh, when I learned that the Diary of Anne Frank is no longer required reading in school. Same. And then you see the whole thing with, you know, uh, immigrants and down in Texas when they're putting literally spears in the water. Oh yeah, people are just trying to come to America for a better life. That's what America was built for. Right. And supposedly based on. Um, so there's just, you know, there seems so much cruelty in the world these days. And mm-hmm. I think that's 
um, it kind of gets me out of bed. <laughs> you know, I could be really depressed, but it's like I have to use my craft and art for good. Right. And so that's why I've been focusing on things like uh, Anne Frank. I've been doing uh, my suicide note play, traveling around the country, acting in it. I'm doing it in the Cape in September and uh, Virginia in October, Austin in January. Uh, so I go into different communities and act with local actors. So, yes. I mean, we've been I... jumping all over the place. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's I, okay. I a little bit of coffee. And, uh, <laughs> that's my Gilmore Girls thing. Just coffee, okay. Coffee, coffee, I know. Coffee. I'm like, I have my brain's jumping all over the place too because we have so many things to talk about. And I want to tell people how we know each other and how we met is through Eris Alvarado, who was on Gilmore Girls, who is in your Latinx production of The Diary of Anne Frank, who is absolutely incredible. And that show, I met you there and it was my first time going to a play in like years because it was like my first play after COVID. And I left there. I was like, what a way to break back into this, like sat by myself sobbing in the corner. And it was so beautiful and it was so well done and heartbreaking and like informative. And you had a Holocaust survivor come do a Q and a afterwards. Like it was, it's insane to me that this is banned from schools and like people just like, don't even believe that that happens. And I want to just applaud you for having this vision of doing it with an all Latinx cast. So well, it's why only did the you... characters in the attic with Latinx? And mm-hmm. let me explain that a little bit. So uh, back in 20, I guess, 18, uh, the last administration was doing a very cruel child separation policy by literally ripping kids away from their parents. Imagine that. Mm-hmm. Stripping them of all their clothes and give, we paid for U.S. citizens giving them government issued gray hoodies and gray pants, sweatpants, which is why I put the cast in that at the beginning of the play. Mm-hmm. I was horrified and I didn't know what to do about it. And then I saw the CNN report about a Jewish woman in Los Angeles who was hiding a Latina mom and her two daughters when that woman's husband was suddenly deported by ICE. I thought hiding a family, that is literally... We are living in the times of Anne Frank today in L.A., in my city. And then a light bulb went off. I'm like, wait a minute. What if I staged that play, but I put in the attic uh, only Latinx actors? And my vision of the play is I'm not doing a realistic version of the play. And I have to tell you, um, we're continually doing it in September and, uh, I put out a cast breakdown for understudies and replacements. I'm hoping it would continue. I would love to take it to Texas and Florida, mm. and New York, but I'm getting pushback from a few Jewish actors. They're like, how dare you? This is insulting. You're taking our story and blah, 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 blah. And these Latinx actors better be Jewish. And I'm like, wait a minute, you didn't even read my statement on the website for casting. I'm inspired by this, by that CNN report. So my vision is surreal. It is about uh, some Latinx families being hidden, not knowing the story of Anne Frank. This woman who's hiding them gives them the script. Literally, you saw in the beginning of the play, a woman walks in and they start reading the script without sound, lights, costumes. And all of a sudden we... The scripts magically disappear. No one sees where they go. Lights are added, sound, and then suddenly in Act 2, they're all in period clothes. So for me, it's these people going through what they are today, putting their feet in the shoes of people of from Anne Frank's time mm-hmm. to feel how they felt. Right. How is it the same? How is it different? Right. Because I was taught as a Jewish person about the Holocaust never again. So I this is a cautionary tale. It's my theme. Mm-hmm. Make sure this doesn't happen again because we're getting close to it. Yeah, I'm, so so I wish people would either do research. You know, the people go online and they just start criticizing and commenting as right. uncomfortable without even. And I can have the discussion with me if you still feel uncomfortable. Let's talk about it. Come to the play, mm-hmm. and then we always have a talk back. But also, like you said, we had a 92 year old Holocaust survivor. If this play is good enough for her. <laughs> Right. Went through the Holocaust. I think it can be good enough for my Jewish actor friend. Mm -hmm. And I just directed a play at the Road Theater Company 
they have a summer new place uh, festival. And it was a play about identity. And there was a whole Jewish family in it. And I was very adamant, like, please, can we cast as many Jews as Jewish people? Mm -hmm. So I'm very, you know, uh, sensitive, but uh, that's why my vision of this play has to be done this way. I couldn't cast Jewish. uh, And some of the actors have been Latin and Jewish. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask these critics, so can only people that's mothers are Jewish? Because that's technically makes you Jewish. Mm. Their fathers are only Jewish. Can they do the play? What if they were raised Catholic and converted to Judaism? Can yeah. they do the play now? I right. mean, you start going down this road and you're going like, who can do this play? Can other people read the book and play? Right. Like, can't perform it? I mean, it raises a lot of questions. Yeah, I think we've gotten to this really like dicey area of like only this person can play this part. And it's like... I understand that, but I also am like, shouldn't we just really want to bring life to this story no matter what and raise awareness no matter what? Like if they're honoring the truth, then that's okay. Yes, we're keeping Anne's story alive right. in a new way. But for me as a director, I don't would want to just, I don't think, cast it just openly. And I've been right. asked like, why don't you cast like all different kinds of people? No, I'm telling the story of, based on that CNN report and and the hiding and the connection between hiding families today. And that's why I end the play with Childish Gambino's song, This is America. Mm -hmm. So I go full circle. I take them back into the past, but come back and say, folks, this is America. This is where we're headed. You know, Hitler was elected. He's an elected official. They voted for him. And something I just learned, which I I love TikTok, maybe it's not true, but... (laughs) What percentage of Germans back in World War II do you think were Jewish? Oh, I don't know. One percent. Wow. So think that that Hitler was talking about and getting the fear of one percent mm. of people made my community the boogeyman and the mm. people that we had to exterminate them, including yeah. gypsies and LGBTQ and so yeah. Anyway, it's a long way from uh, the Brady Bunch, but uh, <laughs> but uh, it, you know I've done been lucky to have write a lot of fun comedies and also some you know important things like lesbian kiss episode of Roseanne and sexual harassment and Golden Girls. Um, but of late, I've wanted to marry art and advocacy together. Yeah, I love but that. The, the commonality I think between all my work is that there is a heart and a sensitivity. And yeah, I'm pushing some buttons, not to push buttons, just because I'm attracted to social issues and I care about people. And it's it's really so disheartening to watch today. Why has cruelty become, people think that's powerful. I know. That is just, it's sad. Mm -hmm. What happened to empathy? Why are we not teaching that in high schools? Right. That's almost in some states looked down upon. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's seen as a weakness instead of a strength. Not 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 in my book anyway. Yeah, <laughs> I love that every time you take a sip of coffee, it just says sure, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> and that became such a political thing uh, during the last administration. I can't tell you how many times I saw people posting that because the things that came out of some people's mouths and still do this mm-hmm. stuff is, you know, I still can't get past January 6th and that that. <laughs> happen I, right. I, it's just surreal it's just surreal yeah we got to come back to some form of caring for our neighbors and yeah getting sitting down and again it goes back to your thing about the strike of, of different sides of sitting down and talking and i think all these pieces that i've been working on is just let's start start the conversation you have to be in the room mm-hmm. to start the conversation and i think there's a lot more commonality uh, than we think. Absolutely. I think if you sit down with anybody for an hour, you can find something in common. If you really just go, I'm not going to come in here with judgment and defense. I just truly want to understand. And I think a lot of people don't do that anymore. No, understand and how, how we can all together make this a better planet together to live on together. Mm-hmm. And I think we're seeing a lot of politicians are out to either sell books or become a personality. And right. Not going into government to help solve issues. They're, yeah. They want to disrupt. 
And imagine if they put all that energy into, wait a minute, how can I make it better for everyone? Right. Liberty and justice for all, I say. What part of all do you not understand? All mm. means every single person. Yeah. So you're trans, any color, it doesn't matter. Right. It's, it's not that hard of a concept. Yeah, we're all it's human. All, yeah, it's just, oh, some of the people, or you're better, you have more rights. No, all. Yeah, all. I agree. I agree. I want to get into how you even got because I'm like, you wrote for Golden Girls, but I'm like, you had to be like 16. Like yep. in my head, I'm like, I feel like Golden Girls was so long ago, but I'm like, wait, you're wait a minute. I'm like, hey. you're not old enough to be writing for Golden Girls. What are you talking about? <laughs> How did you get onto writing for Golden Girls? Wow, that's just a big question. I mean, I've been creating uh, entertainment since I was seven years old uh, in my basement in, in the suburb of Detroit, Michigan, just plays with my kids from school. Mm -hmm. and then I started rewriting the plays when I went to summer theater camp because they I felt they were all too corny about princes and princes and frogs and, you know, shit like that. Yeah. Um, and then I like, but I never thought of myself as a writer and I just had great ideas and wild ideas. And then I met my writing partner in, um, at NYU and we started writing together. So very early age. Yeah. And I went to school at 17 college and wow. We started writing, uh, well, because I have a late birthday, but, um, you know, I was y very young in the acting program with mostly transfer students. So I was forced to grow up really quickly because they were all like 19, 20, and they were just, they were, they were, ready. and there's a big difference between being a, um, a very sheltered suburban kid and then suddenly you're in New York City, you know, the craziness that was going on back then between. Mm -hmm you know, drugs and clubs and all that kind of stuff. Um, and um, so my writing partner, Jim Berg, and I started meeting in between classes and after school jobs. And we, we just both were lovers of television. And we just started writing television pilots. We didn't know any better. And um, then he had a writer's manual book of agents. And we got a, a, an agent that handled newscasters. And he took <laughs> us on and sent our stuff out to California. And wow. One man, Gary Keeper, um, read it, worked at Paramount, and he became our mentor. Um, unfortunately, he did die of AIDS years ago, mm. but um, he really pushed us and got us started in the business here. And, um, you know, luckily we were out in LA less than a year and got our first staff job on an ABC sitcom. And from there, we just kept pushing and writing and luckily landed on Golden Girls really quickly in our careers and that changed the trajectory of our lives. Oh, I can imagine. I mean, that show is still, I can't tell you how many people come on here and they choose Golden Girls for their comfort show. <laughs> yes. And even my nephew, he just went to a one-year-old birthday party and it was Golden Girls themed. No, <laughs> I'll just, man, I'll just send you the picture. Oh, it is, I've got to do that. He has like this little, they had all these like um, things for like a photo booth and he had his little Sophia wig and glasses no. on. It's so cute. It's so funny. That but yeah, I mean, that show just stands the test of time. And it's these incredible performances by incredibly talented women. And the writing is so freaking quick. Like, it is just, I mean, why do you think that there are no sitcoms like that anymore? Well, for us, it was uh, really writing College 101. We mm -hmm. were learning how to write. I didn't think myself as that funny. And we were forced to write some hard jokes for the best of the best actors. Mm -hmm. Oh, for the best. Uh, you make really strong characters. And, um, you know, and then, it, then it's just, you know, lightning in a bottle. Like, right. you no, know, it, it happened to be the right time. Nobody thought that show with that age of actors and female actors would ever be the hit that it is. But again, if you trust the writing, and they did, they yeah. read those scripts. There's, you know, if you go online, there's sometimes people do memes or talk about, oh, that's so funny how they all ad libbed and they're laughing. And like, no. <laughs> They are such good actors that they looks like they're ad living. They read every single line. Mm. As um, uh, and yeah, I mean, whenever we pitch shows, we're like, it should be like Golden Girls. Just pick the best of the best. Mm -hmm. 
put them all in one show. And um, but they were really lucky, you know. And then to have three that have done so many sitcoms, and then you put someone like Estelle in there who is just, you know, so great on stage and such a trained theater actor, but mm-hmm. still had only one major theater uh, success in Torch Song trilogy, uh, which I had just seen the summer before. Um, and loved it. And as we were writing, like, I think a spec love Sydney show. I mean, you probably don't remember that show. It was a show about Tony Randall. Um, and like to have her, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not only someone I write for, but become a really good friend. Cause I got to hang out with and go to parties and stuff. Uh, I'm so lucky. I, I, you know, I think of her often and I, I miss our phone calls. I remember mm. back when she was just a really good listener, but she was also like a Jewish mom and she had advice and she was not shy about telling you her opinion on things. Yeah. She really took us under her wing and, and took care of us at a time when we had to be in the closet on the mm. writing staff. And people find that so shocking with Golden Girls because it was such a progressive show, but it was also at a time when in the work environment and in Hollywood, you were not out. You kept that quiet. Oh, wow. But she knew, she could tell, she had good gaydar. And, uh, <laughs> she knew right away and she told us, And uh, but she said she'd keep our secret. And I always wonder, I would love to ask her, you must have told B. Arthur because B. Arthur was such a su- uh, supportive ally. Hmm. I would love to like know. Maybe I should like um, have a, an ex acting student that talks to uh, dead people. I should have her talk to Estelle and find Do out. Do it. I know. I just read my tarot cards before I started this podcast. <laughs> oh, good stuff. I'm very into it. I'm very into it. It was all about trusting your intuition. So let's, okay. But that is really. I always say that trust the rhythm of life. That's yeah. something I've been saying since probably high school. I don't know where I got it from, but I kind of, I love visual images. And I think of like being on a roller coaster, Mm -hmm. you can't get off it. So what do you do? You ride it. And sometimes it's like slowly going up. And then sometimes you're screaming through the whole thing, but just acknowledge you're in that car, just go for the ride. And um, there's some exhilarating things. And then you know what happens when it's over? You want to go again, (laughs) you know? So true. That is such a good way to put it. You do. You're like, oh, that was that was kind of crazy. But you want to go on again? I want. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so amazing. It's really cool to think about, like, just that time of you know the golden age of television and being a part of that and being a part of so many families of watching these shows together. And you also were a writer for Gilmore Girls, which is. Like for me, it's friends, then Gilmore Girls, what? and like I think we need to switch those. I know, but uh, why look, friends? Oh my gosh, do you not like friends? Um, we were in, we were writing on the Gene Wilder show at the time, mm. uh, and I remember we were interviewing for that, and uh, down the hall we heard uh, uh, David Crane and Marta Kaufman screaming when they got the pickup. We were, we were oh there. my god. Yeah. And my writing partner actually went to school with David, went to, sorry, went to camp with David Crane. Um, you know, I celebrate it. Uh, my late friend, Allie Willis, was one of the writers of the theme song. Oh, uh, wow. I'm glad. I'm Which out. is my ringtone. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, it wasn't something I watched. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, wasn't kind of my jam, but. You know, I, I appreciated that was there. And yeah, for for me, I mean, I could talk about friends for forever. I mean, I literally like I have the yellow door frame on my wall yeah. on the like my apartment's purple. I'm kind of psychotic when it comes to friends. It just makes me feel like I'm not alone. Like I'm just like these are my friends and they're very comforting to me. But Gilmore Girls is like that also. And I find like I watch Gilmore Girls when I am not fully depressed but i could feel it coming on and i'm like i need to escape to stars hollow like i just need to be there and i think lorelei is just like the epitome of strength and like handling shit and getting shit done and like she's so incredibly smart and witty and beautiful and i look up to her and i was lauren graham lauren i know all of those things oh i'm obsessed with her so you have not been to the fan festival 
Back I haven't been to the fan fest, but I did what? do the Warner Brothers tour. So I need to come to a fan fest to see you and Eris and Shelly Cole. Shelly's also been on the podcast. Oh, and cool. yeah. So, so the, Mike, that was fan, a fan started, a fan couple, Jenny and Marcus Whitaker. And we all go back east every fall. And, we, and it's been in different towns in Connecticut and, and Maine. And the leaves are falling and you're in literally a star's hollow town. <sighs> I love that. The little villages, and then we just descend on it. And it's not like a con where people are, you know, like Comic Con or where they're selling things. You buy a ticket, but then you're just hanging out with us. We're like going to dinners and we're going to the bar and we're going dancing and we're just sitting there talking. And it's, it's, it's just, uh, it's become a family in a way, all these pe- wonderful people. And yeah, it's thankful for that. It's amazing when you meet people who you watch on television and you respect who work in the industry and they become just like your pals. Like Shelly and I have never met in person, but I had her on and we talked for like two and a half hours and we text all the time now. She's like, how are you doing? Are you OK? Do you need anything? Like she's the coolest person ever. And like Eris is one of my dear friends. And now I've met you and it doesn't feel like like this is like the first time we met you know what i mean like we're all I just like i met eris like god six or seven years ago and we were in like an acting class together he's such a good actor I he's can't... incredible and his voice like just hearing his voice alone you're like oh my god it's eris like it's amazing but he's able to bring humor but do the drama mm-hmm. and he's also one of those people that he's like all right where do you need me that you need me to bring Yep. The, next to the, like I'll do anything. I'll stay after. I'm like, he just jumps in. No yeah. bullshit. Nothing. You know, yeah. drama. It's just I'm here. I got gotcha, you done. <laughs> right. Right. And that is such pure joy, and I, I'm so lucky. So, um, yeah, to have done he's done some readings. Um, mm-hmm. just, I, I adore. So, how did you get involved in Gilmore Girls? Because you did more than just write for that show, correct? Or no? We were producers on it. So. That's right. We had met Amy Sherman Palladino, which was just Amy Sherman on Roseanne. Mm. Uh, and I'll never forget, it was probably our second day there. And there were 21 writers, a huge room. And wow. um, we were working in the room on a story for Darlene. And then Amy came in late. You know, she came with her hat and fishnets. <laughs> she's wearing. And she sits down at the table and she'd been on the show a couple of years. And by the way, we passed on on the first season of the show. They offered mm. it, we said no. But we went on later on in season five. And um, and she came in the room and she was like, Darlene would never say this. And this is why. And this is, well, no, no, fix it. If you do this, da, 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 da. And she just like figured it all out. And we're like, who the hell was that? Right. And we all broke for like the bathroom break or something. And Jim and I ran up to her and we're like, who are you? We have to know who you are. You're just... And so we became fast friends. And so when we would split up into rooms, she would always say, I want Jim and Stan and Lois Bromfield. And she would uh, she would grab us and she would say, get in the car. We're going to go write some Darlene theme. And I'm like, no, the other writer's going to hate us. And she goes, shut up, get in the car. <laughs> and we get in the car, we go to a restaurant around the corner and she'd order a bottle of wine. And we'd be like, no, 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 they're going to smell wine on us. And I was like this you know, nervous Nelly, mm-hmm. like get over it. And we came back with brilliant scenes. And uh, then we stayed in touch with her. We went to her wedding. We were hung out a lot when she was unemployable because mm-hmm. people thought she was difficult and she couldn't get anything sold. And we're like, let's work on something. We got all these ideas and figure it out. And, um, and then uh, Gilmore Girls, she hit it with that. Mm-hmm. And she was having problems. We were on overall deals then. And she was having problems keeping writers. Nobody really got her and she didn't want to be in the room with them for whatever reason. And she said, uh, one day she just called and said, meet me at the Chateau Marmont for martinis. And we're like, uh, you had me at the Chateau. Right. Martinis was a nice part of it. And she said, I want you guys to get out of development. Just give me one year. I just need to stabilize on the show. We're like, okay, we'll give you one year. We'll we'll be there. And I said to her, you have a hit show. It's so smart. You should be enjoying every moment of this. You should not be in turmoil and fighting with the network. And and I said, I, that'll be my job. I just want you to have a good time. Let's just yeah. have a good time. And we just laughed a lot on the show. And uh, we, you know, we're just going to be consultants slash writers on it. And uh, 
you know, we ended up having to take on a little bit more responsibility, but we didn't mind because I just, I fell in love with Lauren. We hit it off. Uh, I, for the first table read, we were you know, taking one of those little, uh, you know, things over to the, one of those little carts and on the lot. Yeah. <laughs> and I got out of the cart and I saw Lauren over by, she was by a truck, literally like Lorelei smoking her a cigarette. And I marched right over and she looked at me. It's like, oh, you can't talk to me. You're going to get in trouble. Amy's going to fire you. I'm like, let her. I'll I'll just go home and collect my pay. I was like, I want to talk to you. You know, I've been working all summer watching the episodes. I had to watch all five seasons to catch up to the story. Yeah. And uh, she was just, she loved that I was just so brave and didn't give a shit. Yeah. We just became friends uh, off set. And, um, And I just loved writing for her. I just think. I was going to ask who on the show was it like the easiest to write for when it uh, came to character? Was it Lorelai? Like just. I love Lorelai the best, but I, I didn't realize till I got on the show and wait a minute. I have a, a grandmother, a mother and a sister who are very mm. similar like that. Like my grandmother and my sister are kind of closer types. Yeah. And my mother was kind of the outcast. So I was like, wait a minute, it's kind of them. And my grandmother was mm. kind of very polished and always together and very much like Emily. Yeah. And so I could lean into writing like that. I mean, Suki was fun. Kirk was weird. Um, <laughs> I, you know, of course, everyone had a big crush on Logan. So we added him to the year we came on. And uh, I am forever grateful for you because I am the biggest team Logan. Me too. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you. When people are like team Jess, I'm like, but h- literally how? Like Jess was like a blip and he treated her like garbage. Logan did everything for Rory that she ever wanted. And like. Yeah, we had an affair on, on that. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't like that part in the. Yeah. In the where movie. it was like, oh, we weren't really together. I thought we were broken up. Like mm, girl, bye. But yeah. I, my favorite seasons are the ones where Logan comes and were you responsible for the life and death brigade? Yeah, of course. Oh my God. uh, Like team Robert was named after my nephew, Robert. I love that so much. So we did the Pulp Friction one. We wrote that one. Incredible episode. Opening the eighth, you know, when in the, in the Yale newsletter thing, Mm -hmm. that was us. Um, so when we were casting it, I was coming to work one day and they were down to the final two actors for Logan. And there was a blonde, cute guy and a dark haired one. I walked into the writer's room and Amy's there. I'm going, you got to cast the blonde. Yeah. Like, Why? I go, just trust me. I just have a feeling. I like the way he looked with her, the dark mm-hmm. and the light. You hadn't really seen her with a blonde person before. Right. And it seemed very aristocratic, very much like the Emily yes you know lifestyle that's what i thought was so cool it was exactly what lorelei didn't want her to go for but you know he was still so good and understood her background right right. Um, so that's why i just think they they felt right for each other Mm -hmm. push each other's buttons and make each other better people yes That's, (sighs) that's why i just wanted like Logan, don't fuck around. Be be good to our, our little Rory. Yeah. Did you find it was easier to write for Gilmore Girls because you had to write so much? Like Harder because harder. our shows are usually, if you think, a minute per page. So an hour show would be 60 some pages. They talk so friggin' fast. They were 90 pages of dialogue. That's a lot to write. Mm-hmm. A lot. Um, but there was also something freeing about it in that usually before and all the shows we'd worked on, you kind of wrote down to the lowest common denominator so that everybody would understand every single joke. Yeah. Everybody has to understand all of America because you want the most people watching. And what Amy did so brilliantly was that it was like, who the fuck cares? Like, you know, look up, you know, who is Bobby Darren or Paul Anka, whoever it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But those girls that watched it didn't know who Paul Anka was. It's okay. It's okay not to know. It's okay to discover it. Yeah. So every time when we write now and they go, we don't understand the joke. Well, well, it worked on Gilmore Girls. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's okay to, to, that was her world, her crazy, very specific world. And, that, and I love mm-hmm. that music well, and all the actors. And I've gotten very close with Liz Torres, who played Miss Patty. Yes. And I just orchestrated a little uh, reunion with her and Babette, Sally Struthers. And they hadn't seen each other in years. And I was just, I, I've been working on it for years. And so that was really a special 
Yeah. Special morning that I got. I got. Gosh, I mean, that show is so special to me. I, there's nothing. I, I think during, co- during COVID, like when we were in lockdown, I got my appendix out and I was at my parents' house. And literally the only thing I watched was Gilmore Girls. I watched it all the way through three times during the pandemic. Like it was like, oh, well, this is over. It looks like I'm, I wouldn't watch the last two episodes oh. because I was like, I just don't need to know that it ever ended. Like, I just can't. <laughs> And do you want more episodes? Yes, I want more. And I, w- I kind of wish the reboot would have started Earlier. with her saying that she was pregnant and then we would have seen what happened and who the father was and everything like that. Like I really wanted to like, cause I mean, I, I obviously think that Logan is the father. That's what I think too. But so well, like, I knew those were the last words. So Amy, probably in some drunken stone years <laughs> ago had said it to me and I was like, <laughs> Everyone made such a big to do. We're like, I know what they are. I can't, I won't say them, but yeah. I knew those were the, the last words. So that would have came up to it. I'm like, okay. We'll, yeah. We'll but I think it'd be so interesting. I mean, I wish Rory was in the reboot a little bit more successful. Yeah. Uh, as far as career wise. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry, my, my friend just come. They're staying with me. It's okay. This is the one I watched the Brady Bunch movies with all the time. Oh, Jake, do you want to come say hi? Hey. So, Jake. Yeah, you have to show them that that mug. It's amazing. Where is Jake? <laughs> come say hi. Hi. How are you? <laughs> hey, oh, my God. Sure, Jen. We've literally been talking. It's amazing. We are. I'm obsessed with these movies, so thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your service. <laughs> and to you. Thank you for watching. I, I would love to give you more uh she'll tell you we've been pitching the brady ladies where they okay, all moved, the to, brady west, ladies. They've oh, moved yes. to west hollywood <gasps> today but they're stuck in 1983 yeah oh my god you'd watch that right <laughs> um i mean i live that so thank yeah, you there you go okay. <laughs> <laughs> but nice to meet you thank you for your work seriously there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's who i'm talking about when i say we love these movies <laughs> cool <laughs> So speaking of Gilmore Girls, you worked with Shelley Cole in your play yeah. about what it, it's called. It's called Right Before I Go, R-I-G-H-T. So mm-hmm. literally what people um, that choose suicide uh, do right before they go, some of them write notes. So mm-hmm. you hear it as, as writing. So I had a very close friend die by suicide. 11 years ago I'm and sorry. I, as a comedy, thank you. As a comedy writer, I was just lost and the, there was still so much shame around the topic. I was like, mm-hmm. what can I do? And he had written a note and I was listed in the note, but I couldn't get the note from his ex lover. And uh, so I started collecting notes like Kurt Cobain and war veterans and LGBTQ and kids that were bullied, hoping to find in the, those notes the why. Yeah. And then I thought, wait a minute, what if I did a theater piece like Vagina Monologues with four actors at stools, music stands, reading all those notes and facts about suicide? Mm. Like they give at the beginning a number and they say, while you're sitting in the theater, like 30 people are going to kill themselves. Oof. Like, like all over the world. Yeah. That's what people do. They go, oh. They can't yeah. breathe. So I started that at the 2015 Hollywood Fringe Festival. And um, then uh, a New York producer optioned it and uh, we got a great Broadway director involved. And he said, is there any way for you to put your story of your friend in the play somehow? Mm-hmm. Because you're so funny and you'll humanize it. And I was like, oh, I don't know what I I really didn't want to. I've never written alone. And I was like, I can't do that. And then I thought, well, I'll create a narrator character mm. be like me, but it won't be me like me. And then every reading I did it with it, all my friends said, man, just say it's you. you. Don't just mm-hmm. say you're a writer. Be specific. Say mm-hmm. You're a comedy writer. And that's your perspective on it. So I did. And we were going to do a big reading of it eight years ago in Orlando on Suicide Prevention Day. And the day before, the guy playing me drops out because he got a big paying job. Mm-hmm. And the director goes, Stan, you're in. <laughs> you're doing it tonight. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, I hadn't acted since college. <laughs> and um, we sat down to just do a table read. And at the beginning, I got to my friend's name. And it got stuck right here. Oh. I couldn't say it. 
Yeah. I literally thought if I said it, I would just be like Niagara Falls. Right. But I got through it and my classes did fill with tears. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing it all around the United States ever since then. Um, yeah. I've done a virtual version during COVID with opposite uh, Hill, uh, opposite Blair Underwood and Vanessa Williams. Wow. They did it in Detroit Live with Hill Harper. I've done it with high school students, faculty, teachers all over. Um, I got to do an East Coast um, five city engagement last fall with Shelly Cole and uh, Nick Holmes and Virginia Madsen. Mm-hmm. Very exciting. And I'm doing it in the Cape uh, September 24th um, at the Cape Cod Theater Company with Emily Carota, Mrs. Kim. Oh my gosh. And Max. Oh my gosh, Max. Yes. <laughs> and me. And then um, uh, Scott Cohen. And then two local uh, young uh, performers. And I go and I do it um, in October 7th and 6th and 7th in uh, Virginia. And then in Austin, I'm going to do it at the end of January. That's amazing. And if you ever do it here in LA again, I would love to be a part of it in some way. Because I, when I, I was 13 when I lost my first friend to suicide. And it's definitely been something very, I mean, I've lost a handful of friends to suicide after that too. And when Shelly was explaining this show to me, I was just like, you know, I wish, you know, when I was 13, I didn't understand, you know, I don't even think the person who passed away understood it. And we don't have, you know, kids, especially young kids, young adults, they don't have the tools all the time to understand what's going on in their brain. And so to bring awareness to something like this, the way that you're doing it, I'm just very grateful for that. And it's something I wish I would have had when I was younger to be like, oh, okay. So like the thoughts going on inside my brain, I'm not the only person. So what because, we did at Town Hall in New York, mm-hmm. so, and we specifically invited a lot of schools to it. Yeah. The teachers came up to me and literally hugged me, grabbed me, and they said, you don't understand. We have no tools, like you said, right. to start talking about this with kids. And you created a piece through theater that these kids can be in or see and talk about. So it's only an hour play, and we require that uh, you have a mental health professional do a talk back with the cast after the last half hour. It was my first play uh, published and licensed through TRW Plays. So now a theater companies all over are starting to do it. Some of them bring me in to play me. Some of them mm-hmm. hire people to play the narrator, which is kind of weird and cool. And I, I get online with them and I get to meet the cast who was done um, on Long Island. It was done in uh, Wisconsin. Um, I was brought in um, to Alabama. So I was supposed to do it at a college in Florida uh, last January. And um, the head of their mental health department stopped it because he felt talking about suicide would make more kids do it. No. Shocking. I posted about it. And a friend of Eris's actually who runs the theater department in Alabama said, I'm bringing you in here to do it. Yeah. And, uh, it was pretty incredible to do it there. Um, and I think it's the opposite. If people talk about it, then kids won't write notes. I think the people that are most scared about doing it are people my age and older. Yeah. I found, and even with the first time I did it in 2015, my friends said, I want to bring my teen kids, can I? They were scared. The teen kids after it were like on the street with me for like an hour. Yeah. They so they want to talk about it. Remember, right. these kids today go to school and they don't know if they're coming home. Yeah. Because of gun violence. Yeah. I didn't have that growing up. Right. I was like, maybe there'd be a tornado. We did tornado drills. Mm-hmm. We did shooter drills. Right. So it's part of their vocabulary and they need to talk about it. I had, when I did it from the first times in Claremont, um, this girl who was in it, uh, they gave me microphones. And after the play, um, I went to the lobby and I met people and talked to them. And then she came up to me and said, I'll walk you back to show you where to put the microphone headset. And I said, I know where it is. She goes, no, I want to walk you back because she wanted to tell me. She said, I'm a cutter. Mm. And I just had to be a part of this play. And thank you for letting me, you know, you work through this and have this opportunity to be a part of this play. Right. And, you know, it, it, 
sometimes it just bowls me over with, you know, what we can do with just a simple theater piece. Yeah, absolutely. And especially for the people who are in the production, like it's cathartic for them and they may not feel they could actually say these things out loud and take ownership of the words, but to, you know, then be given the written word and get it out somehow. Like it's like you're getting it off your chest and you're getting it out loud and you're cutting the shame in half and you're not beating yourself up. You're not living inside your brain. And I mean, I think it's incredible. And I, I just applaud you for doing that because it is something that so many people don't like to talk about, but as somebody who's lost a lot of people due to suicide, it is, yeah, it's very, it's one, it's the hardest. I mean, all death is hard to process, right? But when somebody commits suicide, then you're stuck in your head nonstop. Like what could I have I done? How is that uh, not to use the phrase commit? So I didn't know that's what, Oh, okay it was i had that a few places and because i was i'm i say this is a learning curve for me too mm-hmm. I'm not a suicide expert i'm not a mental health expert i'm really doing it from my point of view as a very close friend of somebody that right. chose this path so i think they're saying now that the using the word commit makes it sound like it's committing a crime oh but they do say die by suicide but again just just so you know no yeah thank you yeah um but yes, there is still so much shame. But in the play, what I did end up adding uh, before we first opened, but it wasn't originally in the play, was notes by survivors. Mm. So I give hope at the end of the play. So these yeah. are people that attempted it but lived. And they're so grateful that they lived. Because we talked about at the end of the play, you don't know where you're going to be five minutes, five months, five hours from now. Live for what's around the corner. You don't know. So people think, oh, this is going to be such a depressing play. You end up laughing. Yes, there's tears, but you lead with hope. Yeah. And that's what's so cool about it. Yeah, I really love that. Well, Stan, this has been absolutely incredible. And what's, you know, you talk about a roller coaster, that life is a roller coaster. And I feel like this interview has been that because we've gone from literally laughing and like quoting your movies and TV shows to talking about really important things. And like, it's just such a great, like that's who you are. Like, that's you know, life. yeah, that's life. we can cry and laugh and have all those emotions, those, feel everything. Yeah. Oh my God. From Golden that's to my- Gilmore. I'm that's taking a picture book. of the shirt right now. That is amazing. So that's my book coming out at the end of the year. Uh, it's called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore. And it's about all the wonderful women I've worked with and Roseanne. And it's a Valentine <laughs> about <laughs> uh, these great experiences that I've had. And I kept journals literally since college. So take old journal entries all during all those shows that I did. And then I talk about like how I've changed my viewpoint and, you know, how I felt about Betty White when I was on Golden Girls is very different than the way I do now and how we grow and mature. And then I had some great pictures, too, when Estelle Getty came to my surprise me by coming to my 30th birthday party. Um, That was pretty cool. That's amazing. That is so cool. Now, when you you talk about like, you know, there's a lot of incredible women in your life and the actresses that you have been around as well. I mean, yes, actors as well, but the actresses are all very iconic in the zeitgeist actresses. Is there a woman in your life who influenced you the most or that inspired you the most? Yes. And it's all in the book, but it's my mother. Oh, and um, unfortunately, I lost her two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. I. In the end, I have all my entries and I talk about the worst 13 uh, days of my life was when she was in hospice. Mm. And um, I realized at the end of the book that she was my one true golden girl. Mm. She was my best friend and my biggest supporter. And um, I carry on every day because I know she would want me. I'm going to try not to cry now. That you is will laugh and you'll cry at the but, book. Well. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait for this book. You have to tell me when it's out. Yeah. So I'll be talking about it online. And uh, so it's through Indigo River Publishing. But I think we're going to start pre sales in the beginning of October. And, um, it, you know, there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff, but it's done with love. Yeah. It's honest, but it's done with love. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Stan, what would you say is the 
best piece of advice that you've gotten from somebody else for your mental health or that you would give to somebody for mental health? I think I came up with this myself of just living in the present Mm -hmm. and and learning from every moment. And uh, even the ones that are really tough to get something out of it, to lean into opening your heart more instead of shutting it down to you're hurt in love or some work thing to close yourself out but keep opening it up and as you do you'll bring more people into it yeah receive their love and give love back (sighs) that's beautifully said this was seriously so much fun like thank you for thinking of me and of and, course. Uh, I know we've been trying I, to get together for I so know. long and it finally worked out. I'm in the same city and I could do it. And I'm not in a castle in France mentoring writers. And Oh, yeah. What that was, was that? Uh, it's called Rockabirdie Writers Retreat. Um, yeah, if you're a writer, look it up. I'm going to be doing uh, mentoring again next July. I would actually, I've never been to like that part of France, just Paris for a day. And I really could disappear and live there really <laughs> going into a fairy tale oh. a castle i was in a castle and having amazing food prepared by chefs and wine every night and with all these wonderful creative people there were four mentors and we all have four mentees mm-hmm. and we just talked about writing and life and it was a, a week of, of joy i did two back-to-back sessions and i'm going to do a couple more next summer and uh, it's just an extraordinary experience and to be in another country, everything, but there are people from all over the world. Now, when the strike ends, what would you, what do you hope to jump into? Would you jump into another sitcom? If it was the right one, I have so much theater and, uh, productions on my plate. Yeah. I, I'm kind of focusing on that. I'm hoping to also, I would love to do a book tour. Um, when my book comes out, I, I just love going and meeting people and mm-hmm. I love hearing stories of what golden girls and Gilmore girls meant to people face to face. Yeah. So I'm hoping that that can be a part of, of the plan with the book. Um, and also bring my plays into those communities. And that, yeah. Um, you know, it's living out of my suitcase for a while, but I, you know, after COVID, <laughs> I've just been really embracing that. And my mother always said, travel while you can. And I really do believe she's up there being not only my show business agent, but my travel agent. <laughs> not traveled more with work, you know, since she had passed. So she's doing something up there. That's for yeah. Sure. Well, as somebody who is obsessed with the shows and movies that you've done and Gilmore Girls, like I just again have to tell you that Gilmore Girls is such an incredibly special show to me. And I literally like my old English teacher from high school and I, I hadn't talked to her since I left high school and I started watching Gilmore Girls and she had just started watching it too. And she's like one of my best friends now because we would watch Gilmore Girls together and then it just became, we would pick a show and then message each other about it. And we just bond so much over Gilmore Girls. And there's so many things in my life that Gilmore Girls has connected me to and people. And I mean, that show is just like a big, warm, cozy blanket for the rest of my life. So thank you. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I'm glad I could be a little part of it, but I, I do love our little community and they would adore you. So yeah. yeah. Well, next fan fest, I'm there. Okay. Definitely. All right, Stan, Uh, have the best day. Thank you so much for your time. Bye. Bye. Bye.